now. Yes. That's the right direction. I'm left-handed, so I'm always a little directionally challenged. <laughs> so you can imagine what it was like for me driving in Great Britain. But <laughs> thank you all for being here this morning. My name is Melissa Hill Dees. I am a founding partner and vice president with Hands On Connect Cloud Solutions. And I really today am excited to talk to you all, but I'm more the messenger in this case. Um, want to show you just a little bit, tell you a little bit about the customer that I've been working with for the past almost three years now. Their name is Food Cycle. They're based in London. And I say I'm the messenger because they are this amazing nonprofit organization whose mission is really to provide nourishment and companionship for people throughout the UK. They've grown tremendously in the last 10 years, and they've been able to leverage Salesforce to really do that. They are the very definition of an impact first nonprofit because that's their goal, right? That impact and some of the hardest things to measure. So how effective are their meal preparations being and what are they able to do to um, make better companionships, better relationships among people and communities? So a little bit difficult there to, to measure, right? Um, <clears throat> and when I say I'm the messenger for this recipe, here are really the chefs behind what I'm going to share with you today. Sophie Tebbett, who was to be my co-presenter today, and she's expecting a baby, and it's going to be here sooner than we thought. <laughs> so um, you all will please bear with me if I am not as able to answer as many questions as you'd like. But Sophie is the head of programs at Food Cycle. She came on board just about three years ago, just about the time that we started working with her. And Libby Ziemelis is my colleague. She is our vice president of data administration and works with our customers one-on-one -on -one in a lot of cases to perform what I would call solution design, solution architecting, um, to be able to take a look at what that impact that they want to create is and work backward from that to say, all right, so what do we do if this is the impact we want? What do we need in our Salesforce system? What do we need to automate? What do we need to report on? What do we need to create to be able to measure that impact and then take the impact measurements and plan the next phase of moving forward with our project? And so Sophie and Libby have really been the chefs on this. If you know um, Andrew Hill, if you've ever talked to him, in, he's from Australia, but we all know how small the Ohana is, right? Um, geographically, we're not bound. <laughs> so you wind up making friends and collaborating with folks from all over the world. And I love this quote from him because one of the things that we continually find with nonprofits is they generally collect immense amounts of data. Immense amounts of data. How many of you actually work at a nonprofit? Anybody? So do you have like massive tons of data? Ma I mean, literally I have customers who when the spring 19 release came out and they upgraded the amount of data storage, there were people dancing in the streets <laughs> because I literally had customers that were exceeding those limits. And these are nonprofit customers, you know, we're not talking giant corporations, we're talking nonprofit customers, because they collect more data than any people I know. <laughs> what do they do with it? I mean, and, and I know some of you in the room are consultants. What do they do with all that data? My hard and fast rule and part of the recipe really is, if you're not gonna report on it, don't collect it. Rona and I talked about this last night. It's like, why would you do that? Why would you add that field? Why would you collect that data if you're not going to report on it? <laughs> I don't, we might need that someday. Yeah. Exactly. We might need that someday. Um, generally, what I find is those fields like that that get added are never populated, so they're really not incredibly helpful. So, I mean, obviously you can read, but that's the, um, to me, the, the crux of the impact first nonprofit, right? So thinking about that impact to start with and how do we build it to work that way? So 
Also, if you're a nonprofit, you probably have too many cooks in your kitchen. I don't know, is that a, like a genuinely American term or does that translate to, um, to other countries? Uh, more help than you need, is that <laughs> a little bit more translatable? So lots of stakeholders, lots of information that people want, and some of it very legitimately, right? So your funders, obviously, you want to be able to provide for them the information that they need to feel like that their money is being put to good use. Um, from an impact standpoint, if you're familiar with Dan Pelota, who if you're not, look him up on YouTube, there's a wonderful video. And from a nonprofit standpoint, one of the big things in the US is, oh, if you've got less than 10% of your income as a nonprofit going to administrative costs, then you're a really great nonprofit. Personally, I don't believe that. I would rather give my money to a nonprofit that is paying their CEO a living wage and feeding 5,000 children than give my money to a nonprofit who is paying their CEO nothing and feeding two children. So that's one of the places, being able to show the actual impact that you're making regardless of what your administrative costs are. More services are required. And you'll see as we go through and talk about Food Cycle and what they do and how they operate in the community, they needed to be able to scale. They were growing so fast, there was so much need, so many people that didn't have a place to go to get a good meal every day, were wasting away in loneliness and in so many communities throughout the UK. More types of supporters with differing interests. And again, this is something that um, we've done some studies on with millennials and younger people especially. They have more time to give than they have money. And so they're happy to volunteer and they wanna be involved, but they wanna know that their volunteering is making an impact. And so we're able to help with that as well. So we have some tools. So if you're, we're cooking this big impact first nonprofit, we wanna gather all the appropriate tools and found out yesterday that I can't make the wonderful little tiny Dutch pancakes unless I have the appropriate pan to put them in, right? What are they called? Say it for me. Yes, thank you. Oh, God, they were delicious. <laughs> so I don't know how I'm going to get a pan, a poverty pan home. Maybe Amazon can deliver one. But um, <laughs> we need the appropriate tools to be able to build this impact first nonprofit. And luckily, Salesforce.org's nonprofit cloud, with some help, um, provides most of those tools that we need to be able to do that. So let's look at a couple of them. So fundraising, of course, is the big one that everybody talks about, right? Of the 40,000 nonprofit customers that salesforce.org works with, probably 39,998 of them are there for the fundraising part of it. So how many of you are using Nonprofit Success Pack or any of the fundraising tools in in salesforce.org. Yep, or have worked with those, install them for customers. So we won't go into a lot of depth about that because that gets covered all the time, right? That's the one that everybody's used to and that you need to, to know about. This is actually from um, Food Cycle website and the way that they use that from the fundraising standpoint, and they are using Nonprofit Success Pack. But you see, they've done a great job of even applying the donations themselves to the impact that those donations will have. So engagement is another area where we work day in and day out with um, volunteers, with advocates, with donors from the standpoint of the nonprofit. And in this particular case, they've got several different campaigns. Whoops, it's the sexy part, engagement. Yeah, you know, this is public relations, and you know, how many of you were gonna be in public relations when you were young? Because that was so fun and cool and it wasn't really any work. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in fact, their 10th birthday is going on right now. So, and you'll see later in some information that we have 10 years and a million meals that they've served 
over the course of that time. So all of these different, again, different pieces of the puzzle that have to come together for everyone from <clears throat> their volunteers, their funders, their um, donors, individual donors as well. And again, one of those pieces that, that a lot of people get into depth, but we wanna go on to the real meat and potatoes of the presentation, which is program management. And that's what a lot of nonprofits don't think about in terms of Salesforce and in terms of salesforce.org and what the product can offer. So in this case, Food Cycle, um, like I said, came on board. They use Hands On Connect, which is a, a dual app. Um, I say dual. It's actually embedded in Salesforce, but it also has an external volunteer portal. And they can use this, and that's, you see this page um, is the beginning, and we'll go through a little bit of a demo in a few minutes with how they use it to gather information, to gather data, to have volunteers actually self-manage. Food Cycle deploys over 10,000 volunteers a year. So we think about trying to do that with a spreadsheet trying to do that with Excel. And it's just, it doesn't scale, it doesn't work. And that's why they came to us. They needed a way to be able to take some of the burden off of their staff and have volunteers be able to self-manage themselves. And <clears throat> obviously if everyone can do a little, then a lot can happen, right? So um, Sophie was kind enough to give me a quote since she couldn't be here today and um, tell us a little bit about what they were looking for, what they were trying to achieve when they first decided that Salesforce was what they wanted to use and they needed a way to be able to manage all of those volunteers. And she goes on to talk about the strategic planning that they've been able to um, do because of the data that they've collected and because of the work that we have done with them. So I want to show you just a little bit about um, how they're using the system. See if I can get back here, make my everything work appropriately. That's not the right one. All right. And so this is their volunteer portal. And what, what I won't be able to show you, we were able to create a form for volunteers to apply to become a volunteer. That's pretty in-depth. It goes through an entire um, registration process as well as a quiz, a video that they have to watch, a quiz that they have to take and pass based on food safety precautions um, for the appropriate authorities in the UK. And once they have completed that, then they gain entrance to this volunteer portal to be able to choose pro projects that they want to work on. So I'll make it a little bit bigger here. No, not gonna help, is it? Um, <clears throat> but you see they've got 36, 39 locations, I think at this point, throughout the UK. And to volunteer for any one of these, although generally they bookmark because they work in one area specifically, you see that they can sign up themselves, click into any that they are currently interested in working on. So I know I can work Friday on a cook. I can click in, sign up for that Friday, or realizing that this Friday is not going to work, maybe I need to do next Friday. I can even click down into there. So it gives the volunteer a way to self-manage and provide all that information. In the sign-up process, um, they've already collected data on how old you are, um, you know, your name, your address, your, um, they do an, an, sort of an anonymous aggregated data on other information like male, female, um, you know, what your education is, what your background is. Again, so for that impact first data that they're using for their volunteers themselves. So 10,000 volunteers, and the great part is of those 10,000 volunteers, there is a smaller group of volunteers that actually help manage all the 10,000 volunteers. 
So what do you do there, right? And we have another portal that's called their project leader portal. And again, a way for the project leaders to sign up for specific opportunities, specific shifts that they want to work and manage volunteers. They can create the volunteer sessions, manage the volunteers from this portal. And again, you know, more information that they have access to and available to, um, to use to work with the volunteers, to answer questions, to change locations, to contact the volunteers, email the volunteers. One thing that you'll see coming soon is um, a way to text message volunteers from this portal. Um, I don't know about you all, but um, I almost completely missed the .org booth because it was buried in my email <laughs> with everything else that I haven't read while I've been on vacation. So um, a way to text message volunteers if there's a change, if something's happening, right? So all this information that's available to them. And then when they complete their shift, this very important report that asks the volunteer leader who managed that shift and managed those volunteers to be able to tell how many volunteers they served as well as how many participants they served in the community. How many um, kilograms of surplus food they collected. Part of the program itself, they have a team that goes to Tesco's and Sainsbury's and the stores that have food that they're not gonna be able to sell that day or not be able to use that day, gather that surplus food so that it doesn't go to waste. And that's where they create their recipes and serve the, the evening meal. So if there's leftover food, if they sent takeaway boxes home with the folks that there was enough food left over and they track all of that. So all of that information is simple. You see just a short form here that the project leader fills out and submits and, <clears throat> excuse me, and all of that information obviously is aggregated into let me see if I can get into the Salesforce instance now to show you what all of that data. So we're talking 39 locations nationwide, 10,000 volunteers. And so this is their landing page. <laughs> I love that look. Uh, so truly, and, and, and I wish Sophie were here because she would do a much, much better job of telling you all exactly what each of these dashboards reports shows and means and talks about. Some of it's pretty obvious, right? So 12 week rolling average of the meals that they've served and it's broken out by each region, region because they have several regions in the area. The volunteers registered each month. Um, the staff visits that are due, because of course there are certain visits that have to be made on a, on a recurring basis. Um, the number of connections, the past quarter per volunteer. So for each volunteer, are they coming once and never coming back? Are they volunteering the same place, the same time every week? You know, what does that trend look like? Because volunteers, once they're trained, just like a good employee, it's much easier to keep good volunteers than it is to try and find new ones and bring them in, right? So that's part of their volunteer retention program. Um, any monthly incidents, and they don't have any. That's another report that's available. If there's something that happens, you know, somebody like me, I would be the klutz and be slicing the tomato and chop the end of my finger off, you know. So um, anything like that that has to be reported. The surplus food throughout the course. And it keeps going on, right? So the monthly volunteers by region. You see some places are really huge, some not so much. The number of connections per quarter for a volunteer. So maybe they work for a month and they're really excited, but then they're not excited anymore, they don't come back. Um, so again, that volunteer retention that they are working to see there. So lots of different ways <clears throat> And to me, this is always, of course, all that data lives in Salesforce, but, and you can see it individually, you know, we could pull up an individual volunteer contact record, we could pull up a um, individual volunteer opportunity record, 
But to me, this is the key, is that aggregated data, because that's where your impact is going to be, and that's what you're really going to be able to see. Melissa, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, please. On this. Uh, uh, believe it or not, this reminds me of a lot of field service, uh, technical service really? world. And the reason behind it is because what you have is you've got a lot of people who will choose to go to specific events in specific areas. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and it's updated here on the aggregate. Yes. Uh, what else do you give them? So, I mean, uh, so that's the, the time aspect. So when they, are there additional features that you give to them? Because I wouldn't like to have to go and, for example, click in every time. I'd like mm -hmm. to be able to go and uh, say, okay, I'll go every Wednesday here. Or, because uh, for me, uh, I get the, the, the pushing, pushing, and it comes up in Salesforce, but sure. the, the volunteer journey, what am I doing there? Uh, right. what, and, and you have the question of fundraising. Somebody, if they say, okay, I'm going to do time instead of money, is that what the use case is about as well? So there's two questions. Sure, and, and great questions. Thank you for asking them. In fact, um, so there are, depending on the specific business case, and Food Cycle, because of the data that they have seen from their volunteers, their volunteers prefer to sign up for each individual opportunity. The capability is there for what is called um, a recurrence, so that you sign up, if you sign up for this one, then you sign up for every week, for a month, or for three months, or you know, however the customer sets that up. So that capability is there, so that you don't have to click through every time, right? Um, and I don't know, the person that I'm signed in as, because there is an account, and a volunteer history so that you can actually see the upcoming sessions that you're signed up for and this particular person is not signed up and the, the sessions that you have done as well as a running total of all the hours that you have volunteered with Food Cycle. Um, in their strategic planning coming up next is a representation of what that means in terms of impact for the volunteer themselves. So, um, in fact, that's where we're working. We've got a, some of our strategic planning that she's talking about. That's exactly what she's talking about. To your other question about, tell me again the second part. Well, a lot of people uh, will focus on fundraising. Right, the fundraising. And, but, but what you have is that when you come into the site, even mm -hmm. if you say, do you want to give money or do you want to give time? And I didn't see that necessarily. Sure. I think that's good for, for, for mm -hmm. Right. Stephanie was about giving back. So right. This, this aspect yep. of giving back money or time and how to differentiate for that in the site. I think that's interesting. Yep. And that's a great, um, a great thing. In fact, some of that they are already doing because I went straight to the volunteer site. Um, their larger site, as you see, has you know either get involved or donate. So obviously, to start out either way, you can go. Um, but we are working with them to do a better job of showing what that impact looks like, you know, from the donation standpoint versus the uh, volunteering standpoint, the time standpoint. Yep. So all of that in the field is completely run by volunteers. And that's one of the um, cases that we really do want to show because a volunteer leader's time is worth more than a regular volunteer's time. And so in terms of equating that with a donation, right, to be able to show, you know, that your time, you, if you had given cash, it would have been 50 pounds, you know, because you've spent five hours with us. Yeah. Or yeah. you think of the trailhead idea where there's a points uh, yeah. associated with a specific area. Exactly. Or that there's a value associated and that doesn't have to be monetary, but there's... Yep. Yep. Thank you. Did you have a question, Rowan? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> and, and please feel free to interrupt because I get excited and I will just go on. Yes, sir. Is it based on volunteers from Salesforce or do you make 
No, so um, it's not based on volunteers for Salesforce. It could have been done that way, but um, Hands On Connect is actually a managed package that's available on the App Exchange. And so it's very customizable and flexible, but it provides that base, you know, that um, includes the support and includes the uh, template for the page on the, the portal itself. Yeah. All right. I know I didn't pay him to ask that, but <laughs> I'm going to have to pay him later. <laughs> all right. Let me see if I can get back to. So all of that that they've done and accomplished and come through, right? Oops, and it started at the very beginning. Let's see if we can scroll through and get back to where I want to go because the important thing in my mind is really what, you're, what we've been talking about, and that's the, the impact of all of this. And so with their 10th anniversary this year, I want to share with you their impact report. Get out of here, pull this up because it's really incredible what they've been able to do. Oh, not it, sorry. Hit the right place to click. I'll show you. <laughs> Away from the current slide. Let's see if we can get this to come up. So as I mentioned, the 10 years, their social impact, a million meals, one million meals. And I hope that they're going to share the presentations themselves because if you have time to take a look and click on this and read through their social impact report, they've done a phenomenal job of talking about what they've been able to accomplish. So 275,132 community diners that have eaten with them, 424,895 kilos of food waste saved, huge numbers. So equivalent of over a million tasty meals that they've served, right? 227,069 hours given by volunteers. It just takes my breath away. Over 8,200 volunteers registered with Food Cycle. And of course, that's over the past 10 years. This year, they've broken the 10,000 volunteer mark. So <clears throat> to me, those numbers are what are very key. Their impact report goes on to talk about a little bit about their beginnings and what they did and what they do today. And I want to share one quick video with you from this particular um, impact report that they shared and share with you when I, when I first got a phone call from one of the members of their board of directors and he was interested in how we might be able to help them and I said so tell me again what it is that Food Cycle does and he said basically volunteers come together gather all the ingredients and create a meal and anyone's welcome to come and join for the meal from the lord of the manor to someone who's homeless and to me, that really touched my heart because loneliness is one of the key factors that is involved in what they're trying to do and the impact they're trying to make. And loneliness doesn't know any economic range, right? So there's never any, which is a very different situation from most of the things that we do in the US. Usually, you know, we wanna know, are you really poor enough that we can provide this service for you? So that's not what they do. It really is come, join us, don't pre-qualify anyone. But I want to play this quick story from one of the, let's see if I can make it big enough here. Our old age can be very lonely. It depends on you. Nope. You don't have to be lonely not in a place. Well, it Well, let's see. No? Let's try one more time. Yeah, so now it's there. Let's see if it'll play. All right. Our old age can be very lonely. 
it depends on you. You don't have to be lonely in a place like I live in, which is a sheltered accommodation. But you've got your own flat, and unless somebody knocks on the door, which doesn't happen very often, you are stuck there. And the legs are telling me now that you can go where you like, but we're not coming with you. I enjoy watching certain programs on television, and if they're funny, or even sad, and you want to go, oh, to somebody at the side of you, but there's nobody there, then you realize you're on your own. Feel a little bit down, they suddenly hit you, there's nobody there. I think we can all identify with loneliness. We've all probably had times in our lives where we felt a bit lonely. My son, Jamie uh, lives in Japan uh, with his family, whom sadly I haven't seen in the last eight years. I do miss him quite a lot. Loneliness is now being understood as a major risk factor for our general well-being, physical and psychological. And loneliness has been shown to increase the risk of mortality of death by up to 30 percent, which is which is really quite shocking. Evidence suggests there is there is there has been a, a, a dramatic increase in rates of loneliness to the extent that it's been considered a a major public health concern. From fr Thursday night when I stop working till Monday morning, I quite often don't see anybody. That's why I've come here today to chat to someone. It's a lonely old life, buddy. As you can see about food, you struggle with food. If it wasn't for places like this, I wouldn't know what I'd be doing right now. Food cycle helps because it gives you a place to come on a Tuesday evening, gives you a chance to have a meal, sit down, get to know some people, feel that you're a part of a community. You just get someone to chat to and a nice meal at the same time and feel like I can go home and face the world for another two days. A community kitchen like Food Cycle presents a lot more than just a tasty, nutritious three-course meal from, from food that would otherwise be wasted. It provides an opportunity for people that might otherwise be, be lonely and having all those negative consequences of loneliness. It provides an opportunity for them to, to come together and that has a, a whole host of positive benefits psychologically. Well, I think after you leave um, Food Cycle, you, you sort of say goodbye to your friends and see you next week all being well. And you sort of look forward to the week ahead because you know, God willing, that you're going to see these people again and have another laugh, uh, maybe even a sing song, we never know. <laughs> <laughs>
so that you know when I signed up, I wanted to work this shift. I automatically get an email back that says, "Thank you for signing up for the shift. You know, here are the details. Here's where you need to be and when." There's automatically an email reminder that goes out two days in advance of the shift to say, "Don't forget, you signed up to work this shift. And if you can't work this shift, then please let us know because there are people on the waiting list that would like to be included." And then there is a thank you email that goes out automatically after you're there and you've worked the shift and to thank them for their time and to ask them to rate how that shift went. You know, was the, was the shift leader a good shift leader? Did you have a good time? Did you feel like you made an impact? So all those things are automated once that um, volunteer opportunity is created. Uh, beyond that, and that, so that's some of the impact that we're working on that's in the strategic planning for the upcoming year, to be able to say, <clears throat> now that we've got a solid footing on the data and the impact data and that information, to say your time donated had this impact, you know, when we send that thank you email out automatically. Did that answer help? Yep, good. Any other questions, anything that I can? It's mm -hmm. got a very, very strong history of working with NGOs, but there have been situations where um, charities have gathered together with a free phone number to donate, and they found out later that that money did not necessarily go to where it should have gone to. My wife is from Lebanon, which is mm -hmm. uh, it's got Palestinians and Syrians and uh, that area. Sure. And we found out that it was easier to actually go and to give directly to somebody in the country than go through mm -hmm. the channels until we met. I think Corday was uh, was able to provide us the name of somebody who we could validate the money went from the Netherlands to a mm -hmm. specific teacher in um, in Lebanon who yes. was working with the Syrians. So they were able to come back and say, with Corday, this is the specific group where your money is going to. But if I had used the free phone number that a right. lot of Dutch people would use, there is a so much bookkeeping behind it that you don't know who's getting right. benefits. So I do find that your point of who gets the benefit of my money, even if they don't know who I am, I, I'm not too worried about that, but at least you feel you donate to a charity expecting that it's done something and not just giving money to CEOs. Mm -hmm. Right. And that really is an excellent point. I think that's one of the reasons that Food Cycle specifically has worked in regions. And so if you saw on their homepage, you know, it broke out the region. So East Anglia and London and, you know, so that you're, and even beyond that, breaking it down. So the example that I used was Cambridge and Cambridge Wesley Methodist Church is where the facility where they actually host the dinners. But Food Cycle in Cambridge is, you can donate your time, your money, and, you know, and it helps those people locally there in Cambridge. So yes, and being able to um, report that out, narrowing it down even you know, farther than just that huge aggregate. And that's great feedback. I'll share that with Sophie because I'm sure that would be helpful to her as well. Yes? Um, sorry. No. <laughs> And actually, and I should have, we, if we had more time, because I know we're at time, right? 11.20, we're supposed to be done. <laughs> so I don't want to panic the next speaker. Um, and I'm happy to carry on the conversation the rest of the day. Um, in fact, I'll be in the nonprofit.org booth. So um, the, there is actually on the site, if you're a registered volunteer, you can see who else has already volunteered for that shift so that I can see, you know, because I want to volunteer with Roan. But if Sarah's going to be there, I don't want to volunteer that day, you know. <laughs> so that is. Um, and you're right. The next step, in fact, on the roadmap um, from the mobile app standpoint, is that almost like a chat feature, um, like, like chatter, I guess, but not quite chatter. But it's on your mobile app so that you can talk back and forth with the volunteers that work in your shift in your community. So, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.